you hear me? Hey, everybody. This is Rish again uh, and Big. Hey, yes, Big. We're going to pick up where we started. We ended up talking a lot longer than we meant to or I meant to. He just laid there. Poor guy. <laughs> but we'll continue this conversation right now. You can tell a story in many different ways. I guess that's what I was trying to say before about the broken mirror thing. And the other issue I had with the story, a problem that I had with it, was that there came a point where it felt like a natural climax to the story. This is the end. You know, the big boom, surprising revelation. I just hit the microphone. Stop it. This is a surprising shock ending kind of thing. Right. Especially for uh, adventure stories or horror, horror stories more than anything, that shock ending, mysteries, things like that. You know, the Alfred Hitchcock presents the Twilight Zone. And, and it had one of these, but then the story didn't end. And they went back to another flashback, and then they went back to action, and then they went back to another flashback, and then they ended the story. And the second time we read it through, it, all of the post-surprise material, I, I was tempted to just speed read through it. <laughs> get to the end, get to the end, because we'd reached the, the, the highest peak, and the rest of it is just, it's all downhill from here, kids. Again, that's my opinion, but it's just how I felt as a reader, I you see, I'm one of those people, I like to analyze things. I like to sit with somebody after we've gone to a movie and talk about what worked and what didn't work. But why? Why did that work? Why did that part really scare me where she was walking through the hall and nothing happened? But then the part where the killer jumped out, I was no longer afraid. Why? And, and it's just part of my the way that my mind works. But it's also because I want to become a better writer. And, and if I feel like if I understand why the walk through the hall was really tense and scary, then I'll be able to do that myself or I'll be able to incorporate it into a, a scene where I want that same feeling. Right. And so for this, I, well, let me just ask, did you feel exactly the same way? Did you feel slightly different? How did no, you I felt totally the same way. I, you, I, I'm sure I commented it even when we were reading the story and recording ourselves as I was just saying, gosh, it's weird that the story's still going on. You know, it should have ended already. And the the rest of this stuff just seems unnecessary. And yeah, that can be one of those things. We, we've talked about it several times about where we've got this friend who every time you give him a story, he's got this comment where he's always like, oh, yeah. His go-to comment. Yeah, his go-to comment is, yeah, this story ends right where I wanted it to start. He'll always say something like that. Yeah, the part it, where I was most engaged came immediately before the end. Yeah. And, and I've felt that way with a couple of things. He seems to feel it a lot more than I do. But every once in a while, I feel that way. It's yeah. Like, oh. it, sometimes it's hard to know when a story is over or when to start it even. You know, sometimes you, you, you have the story in your mind. And I've done that too. Like there was a story I wrote about a house that was haunted. And I started it, I think, way, way too early had all this stuff about the people moving from their one house to their other house and the story wound up being like 12,000 words when it could have started 4,000 words in and been just fine you would have gotten nothing less out of it so yeah I mean there, there's sometimes it's hard to, to do that you have the story in your mind and you know how it goes from start to finish but what's the best way to tell it what's the most dramatic way where do you start where do you end where does that climax hit, et cetera? How do you go about it? Do you do the thing where the person says, boy, I you know, wish I'd known this was going to happen before I started. And then you go back to the start and tell the whole story. The guy's like, oh, here I am dying from this flesh wound, this gut wound that I've got. Boy, I wish I'd thought about this two weeks ago. And then it starts from two weeks ago. You, know, you get that kind of a story a lot. And there's the whole in medias res term, which is uh, something I, I believe I learned about that in History of Humanities, which is how an epic story must be told. You have to start in the middle of the action. So sometimes, uh, you know, stories will do that, where they'll start somewhere right in the middle and then maybe fill you in on the earlier parts later. You know, there's lots of different ways to go about it. What's the most effective way? I have to admit, I'm not a big fan of the story where it starts out saying, boy, I wish I'd have known. And then they go back to two weeks before. Why didn't they just start at the two weeks before and 
save me the two paragraphs or whatever three paragraphs that they have in there have, have you ever seen fight club the first rule of fight club is that i can't talk about fight club okay well <laughs> fight club starts with edward norton's character he has a gun in his mouth and brad pitt says any last words and he takes the gun out and edward norton says i can't think of anything and then it's kind of a, how did I get here? And it goes back through the whole story and tells. And then at the end of the movie, Brad Pitt puts a gun in Edward Norton's mouth. And he says, any last words? And he takes the gun out. And Edward Norton says, I still can't think of anything. And Brad Pitt says, flashback humor. That's funny. <laughs> to me, that, that's just, that, that's hilarious. But it wouldn't work in 99% of movies. Uh-huh. And... You said, you know, there's any number of ways to do it. And what is the correct way? There is no correct way. Right. It is a correct way for this story and a different correct way for that story. It's your gut. You've got to go with your gut. And sometimes you can screw it up. Sometimes you get it totally right. If there were an A, B plus C equals kind of formula, then, you know, everybody would be able to do it. But with art, it's it's not possible. It's also really subjective and it, it's just it's open to interpretation and people can disagree. And I would like people, I know nobody listens to the show, but I would like people to talk about second person, to talk about starting in the middle, to talk about, I love, I love to write my stories in first person. And it's a crutch. I know it's a crutch, but right. I don't care. I'm always going to write my stories in first person. Or that's my natural tendency to want to do that because instantly I only have to tell one point of view and I can easily keep all sorts of information away from me because I don't know it. I don't know what she is thinking. I don't know where he just came from. I don't know what you mean by that. But I realize that that's a crutch. And some stories, first person just doesn't work. And some stories I may have ruined because I chose to do first person. Yeah, talking about that, my, my wife likes those Twilight books and got me to read them. And they are all written in first person. And the very first Twilight book has a big climax at the end of the book. And the whole thing is about Edward the vampire, right? And he has to... Bella, that's the, the lead female character, if you've never read these books or whatever. She's been bitten by a vampire, and so she's going a to... A bad vampire. Yeah, she's going to turn into a vampire. A bad vampire. Unless... They remove the... Infecting vamp- blood from a bad yeah. vampire. The vampire poison from her veins. So Edward, who talks all along about how he loves the smell of Bella's blood and would love to just... She's like the the perfect chocolate chip cookie or something in his mind. Was, you know, the, the one thing that he loves the most would be her blood. And now he has to try and suck her blood, remove this poison without just going on the rest of the way and drinking her dry. I mean, that's the climax. But it's told from Bella's point of view. And Bella's basically unconscious or semi-conscious at this point. So the giant climax of the book cannot be told well because the character that's the point of view is not even able to witness what's going on. So that's, the I think, an exact example of what you're talking about, where the story's ruined by the point of view that they chose. The big climax, it's not even dramatic at all, because you can't experience it from the dramatic point of view. If it was told in third person, then you could be in Edward's head at that moment and have him trying to do it and going, oh, I can't drink it all, but oh, man, do I want to, you know? You, you've you seen the film. Uh-huh. Is it... Is it pulled off better in the film it because is. it's sort of a third person kind it of? It is actually pulled off better. Not much better because, you know, the film wasn't really very good. But it was pulled off better because of that. Yeah, I mean, it, it has to be a third person. It has to be a omniscient almost or a, I don't know what kind of point of view. What would you call a film's point of view? Cause I would just say third person. It's not really in anyone's head. So, I mean, almost all films are third person uh, unless it's a found footage cam, uh, camcorder type thing. Yeah. But, uh, but you can also have narrator. But that doesn't make it first person. Right. It just makes the... But yeah, uh, it's interesting, that whole thing. Something that Abby Hilton said not too long ago really, really stuck with me. And it made me wonder how much smarter she is than me. 
Oh, it's because definitely a lot. She's not, as far as I know, she's not like a story editor or whatever we are. We are a market and we're uh-huh. so, well, we read tons of stories. But she, she said that so many young writers, so many amateur writers, so many wannabe professional writers know how to start a story because they've done it again and again and again. But very, very few know how to end a story because, you know, they these quit writers the quit in the middle. And I totally, totally am that way. I, I feel, and again, it's subjective, I feel like I know how to start a story, where to start the story, where it should begin and all that. But only a small percentage of the stories I start ever make it to the end. <laughs> and so therein lies perhaps this problem where do you end the story? And with a story like that, let's just say that this story was to serve man, the Twilight Zone episode. Okay. Even if you haven't seen it, you know what the punchline of to serve man is. How to cook for 40 humans. I don't know. I, we could look it up on the internet, but I don't know if to serve man was based on a story or if it was just uh, original to Twilight Zone. But it does that thing that you hate. It starts with him on the ship going back to the alien world, thinking, oh, boy, this is such a mess. How did I get into this mess? Mm -hmm. It just seems like yesterday that the Canamits landed on Earth. And we go back to the start where the aliens have made first contact with Earth, and they come, and they address the United Nations, and they say, we are peaceful, and we're here on Earth, and we want everybody to to gain from our knowledge and in fact we'd like to take some of you up to our world to experience interstellar travel and and you know this is great and and the the canamits leave but they accidentally leave a book and the book is written in their language and so they get a ton of linguists together to try and figure out what this book is all about you know and they managed to translate the title of the book first and it's to serve man and everybody thinks wow these guys are so altruistic or so good. I mean, they, this this whole book that they hold so sacred that every one of them has a copy of is all about how to help us kind of thing. And so they open up their ships to take tons of us back to uh, their world to enjoy, to partake of their riches and bounty. And the punchline is, you know, they translate a little bit more of the book And our main character is a journalist who's been covering all this information. He can't wait to get on the very first Canamit ship. And as he's going up the the stairs to to board the ship, his girlfriend or his his associate runs up and says, we translated some of the rest of the book. Don't go with them. It's a cookbook. It's a cookbook. Horrible, horrible music plays. The, he can't get down the ramp. One of the Canamits grabs him and, and pulls him in, and the ship takes off. And then it's back to where we started, and there he is sitting. And he says, I still can't think of anything. And you know, it's like, that's how I got here. And it's like, you know, it's only a matter of time or whatever. And then Rod Serling comes out, and that's the end of the episode. I don't know if that's the best way to tell that story. But once you realized what the punchline was, what to serve man meant, the story is over and you don't need to see them eat him. Right. You know what I mean? You don't need to see the final fate of all of these people. And if Serling had chosen to have, you know, the, the aliens come in and they all have knives and forks or whatever, would have given a lot of kids nightmares. <laughs> and it might be an even better way of ending the episode. I don't know. I love the way that he did choose to end it because that's what you remember is it's a cookbook. But the story that we read has the revelation of it's a cookbook and then you get a pursuit and then you get the knives and forks and the you character is eaten. You know, I I don't know what was served by... Man was what served. Man? <laughs> no, the cannabis were served. Oh, you mean served on a plate, yes. on a platter. But how do you serve man I, I don't all? know what was accomplished by having the chase and ultimately killing the main character in my mind, if you're going to kill somebody, do it quickly, because if you have a long pursuit and a long chase, it, it seems like, and I've watched a lot of slasher movies, it seems like that person is going to get away. That's why you spend 10 minutes of right. the girl running and, and hiding and knocking down the killer and running, running down the stairs. and screaming. Because you don't waste 10 minutes of your time 
on a character that's just going to get her throat cut or whatever. Um, in I Know What You Did Last Summer, Kevin Williamson sort of turns that on its ear because there's like an 11 minute chase scene with Sarah Michelle Gellar in that movie. And, you know, she gets away and then she hides and then the killer comes back and then she gets away. And then finally she gets to where there's tons of people and she's safe. And then the killer kills her. And you're just like, all of that for nothing. And I know, you know, he did it on purpose Mm -hmm. because you've seen so many movies. You wouldn't have done all this stuff if she wasn't going to get away. Yeah, he did that a lot in those movies that he did in the 90s, though, where he just purposefully took all the tropes of slasher movies and turned them on their heads. Like that start a scream where he has Drew Barrymore, the person that's front and center on the poster, the most famous person in the film. She's the person at the start and you know she has the whole experience and then she's dead and you're like what 10 minutes in and the most famous person in the movie is dead what the crap and yeah it was just another one of those things where just turning it on its on its head on you purposefully uh, messing with you to make you know that hey this isn't going to be like all those other ones we're going to mess with you the whole way through i'll be right back and yeah i mean he did that for a purpose the same way that Hitchcock killed Janet Lee in Psycho after so much buildup of so much of this is her story, so much of this is she is the main character that who knows what audiences thought in 1960. It's impossible to go back. Well, they nobody, didn't want to take showers. But as far as I know, anymore. nobody had ever done that before. And maybe they had. Maybe everything has been done. But it hadn't been done <laughs> quite the way that Hitchcock did it. And I think that that's an homage to Psycho, the Drew Barrymore thing. The, the only other ex- example I can think of, of an ending that just went on and on and on, is The Return of the King, the, the, the third <laughs> right. Lord of the Rings movie. And I saw it opening night. All the showings were sold out until the 1.15 a.m. showing. Holy crap. It and was so dawn when you came out, wasn't it? Bought yeah, the sun was up. We just went to work after the movie. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that's, that's beside the point. I mean, but part of... No, it's not beside the point. Part of the reason I feel the way that I do about it is because of the way I saw it. Yeah. If it hadn't been nearly 4 a.m. or whatever time it was, maybe it wouldn't have bothered me as much that the movie was still going and still going. But it felt like there was a natural climax to the film, which was the destruction of Sauron. You know, the loss of the ring. And then we had a bit, a little bit of denouement, which in the film world is the... the tying f- up of the loose ends. Exactly. The tying up of the loose ends. It's, it's just the cleaning up. Our, our mission is accomplished. Let's congratulate everybody. And part of that was Frodo and Sam are on the rock with the lava. They have their, their speech where... I See, I hadn't read the book. I was like, wow, they're, they're, they, they're going to kill him. That's That's weird. Then the eagles come and they are rescued and it fades to black for like an hour and a half. (laughs) And you know what? I love the Lord of the Rings movies, but for the life of me, I I do not understand this fade to black for like eight, nine, 12 seconds. I've never seen that in a movie ever. (laughs) It it should not be done. They should take the Oscar away. I'm sorry. (laughs) But then Frodo wakes up and he's in the bed and... Everybody is okay. There's a strange orc laying next to him in the bed, (laughs) buck naked, and there's vomit all over the sheets. Sorry, that was a different movie. But okay, so so Frodo wakes up and everybody comes in and congratulates him. I always called this the Gimli moment because for some reason, about a third of the Lord of the Rings movies were shot in slow motion. (laughs) Then they would have overdubbed regular motion dialogue over the slow motion. And sometimes it would be really strange. Gandalf! You know, that kind of thing. But the weirdest one was the Gimli! I would always call it the Gimli moment because, holy weird, how hard would it have been for Elijah Wood to say Gimli that way, trying to match the slow motion that he was watching on the screen? So weird. But everybody gives... Frodo, uh, congratulations, you know, you did it. Okay, and so there's our second ending. Then the third ending, I believe, is the wedding between Aragorn Aragorn and... What the hell is his name? It is Aragorn. Aragorn and 
Legolas. No, slightly prettier than Legolas. Aragorn Liv and, Tyler. and we'll just say Liv and Tyler. Arwen. Okay, they get married. Well, now, okay, so there was the third ending uh, because he says, "No, you bow to no man or whatever to to the the the, the hobbits," and and they bow to them, and they just have this triumphant moment. Again, the end. Then we get a journey home. I can't remember what. Maybe the next scene is in the Prancing Pony. And they're all talking about their adventure. And Sam looks over at... Do you remember her name? I don't. Cute little hobbit girl. She was hot. And yeah, he, he looks at her. With big and, hairy feet. And, you know, they <laughs> smile. And then he gets up to go talk to her. And he never had the balls to go talk to her before. And now he did. He grew a pair. Um, and the, the other three hobbits like look at each other like, wow, you know, the one hot chick in our... In our town. In our shire. And he's going to talk to her because none of us would have dared do it. It, it. But, you know, me and Mary, we're we're gay, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> you had the chance to get a real hot chick and you blew it. <laughs> uh, so there's, there's another ending. Then I believe you get a wedding between Sam and the hot hobbit chick. And then Frodo finishes the book, which is... There and back back again, again. and The Lord of the Rings by Frodo Baggins. And he gives it to Sam. Here's the book. Right? See, I don't know. It's been a while. It's been a while. You're you're remembering way more than I would. Doesn't he sail off in the white ship still, But then the white ships come. And and, and before that, I, I see, I don't remember if there's a journey back to the Shire. And this is when Bilbo has that terrible line where he says, oh, I wonder if... If you still have that old ring of mine, I would so much like to hold it again. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Jesus, dude, you destroyed the ring. Is he still infected by the ring all this time? It makes me cry. I'm so upset by that. And Frodo says, I'm sorry, Uncle. I, I lost that ring. It's like, oh, pity. I kill. Well, I wonder if you might have some heroin then. <laughs> Because something must stop this itch. He's like, you don't know, Frodo, but it was my precious. <laughs> then they go to the white ships. And it is time for Gandalf. It is time for the elves. It is time for Frodo and Bilbo to die, to sail off into the white. This is my interpretation. It is all about death. They die. They die, but they, they say goodbye. They, there's some tearful they goodbyes. Sail off to heaven. And it fades out again. Then Sam goes back to his wife and child and says, you know, I'm home. And that's it. That's the end. And you get the Annie Lennox song. And then I stand up and I ran for the door because I had had the large drink. I bought the uh, combo when I watched that stinking movie. I had like the big popcorn, the big drink. I drank the whole drink. And then four hours later, the movie finally ended. You should have just filled up that popcorn container. I should have just used the cup, refilled the cup out of my free refill by putting the same soda that came in it back in. Now, Now, here's the thing. I'm sorry. I know I droned on and on. And if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, you probably kicked in your MP3 player or whatever because this is blasphemy and and i know that a lot of people didn't like it when kevin smith made the exact same joke except for he had a lot more gay jokes in there the thing is i don't know how you could have done it better let's say that there are eight endings i've counted them while watching it but and i don't know if there's seven or if there are eight but let's say that there are eight which of those eight are expendable which of those eight slow down the narrative which of those eight are important Now, I would stand up and say, first of all, why the fade to black for so, so, so long? I don't know. If I had to guess, I would say Jackson is trying to convince the audience that they died, that it's over. And I don't know why you would want to do that. I don't know why he's done it. I've never seen it done in a movie. I mean, you sometimes see somebody hit over the head or whatever, and it fades to black. But if it faded to black for half a reel... (laughs) <laughs> uh, people, there's your chance to go pee. Yeah, um, I should have. But like the scene in The Prancing Pony, I've always felt like, okay, maybe that's expendable. But it establishes that Sam hooks up with the girl. And then immediately after you get the wedding, I guess that's important because the final shot is him with the girl and the baby. 
and 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 so it suddenly becomes Sam's story in a way. Which, I mean, it's just it. I don't know how you could have done it better. The Return of the King is a really good movie, and I think the DVD, the extended version, is better. But all of those are better when you add in like the details and things that suddenly make sense and a little bit more character, and you find out what happened to Saruman. But yeah, I just. I've heard people complain and I've complained myself about the endings of Return of the King. But could I do it better? No. It was done way better in the cartoon. Oh, I'm sure it was not. Because <laughs> then I'm they, sure they just not. sang that song. What is the song? Is Frodo of the Nine Fingers? Where there's a whip, there's a way. They just did a big reprise and had the whole... Uh, no, I'm just, I, I think they did sing the Frodo of the Nine Fingers song and then he sailed off in the boat. I guess what it is is... Jackson felt like if he had the audience up to this point, that they would go along with whatever he chose to do at the end because he had earned it as a storyteller. If he had told the story properly, that the audience would accept anything. And I know that sounds like a criticism too, but I I remember Peter Benchley hated that Spielberg killed the shark at the end of Jaws by having an oxygen tank be in its mouth and he shot the tank and it blew up the shark. He said, that is bull crap, man. That could never happen. And audiences are going to stand up and boo. You know, the kid is wrong. I think we even talked about this in an episode of The Dune, Steve. Yeah, I think we the did. kid doesn't know what he's doing. And Spielberg said, if I've done my job right with the rest of the movie, they will buy anything that I tell them at the end because I will have earned it by what I built through the first hour and a half or two hours of this movie. And he turned out to be right in the case of Jaws. It just, the rest of the story was so expertly told that who cared that he blew up the shark in a a fantastical way? You know, people cheered. I still just love that. You know, it just, it it, it works so wonderfully. And, And I guess with Lord of the Rings, Every single one of these stories was important because by this point, it was a 10 or 11 hour narrative. Right. Maybe yeah. that's why he ended it eight times because he had to do an ending. He wanted an Aragorn en- ending. He wanted a, a Gandalf ending. He wanted a Sam ending. He wanted a Frodo ending. He wanted the Little Hobbits ending. And that's probably totally right. I just had to pee really bad at that point. So I didn't want any of those endings. Have you never seen it since? I don't know if I have, to tell you the truth. I think that may have been the last time that I saw it. I own it, sadly, and have not watched it. I do plan on watching it sometime soon because my son is finally old enough that he won't pee his pants when he sees the orcs come out and say, We are the fighting Urukai! Or whatever. It has been a long time. (laughs) At least you remember their name. I, I don't know how to change things and how to do things differently. I, you know, they say those who can't do teach. And those who can't teach, critique. Those that's who something can't that, teach, teach Jim. That's something they've said for years and years. And you hear it a lot. And yeah, I'm, I, I can't make movies. And I can't teach people how to make movies. But I can critique. Maybe it's the easiest thing. Everybody can take a step back and look and say, this is what's wrong with this picture. Or this is what's right with this picture. And it's a heck of a lot harder to make your own picture. But I want to. I want to be able to take what I've learned from observation of what works and doesn't work and apply it to my own stuff and know instinctually this is when to end my story because this is the most powerful moment and stuff. And we've done that just as editors on our own show, asking a writer, would you do a little bit more work on this? Would you mind terribly expanding this moment or changing this part or uh, reworking Kind of thing. And I guess that's our right as editors, the same as it's the right of the writer to say, I won't do it. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, I I think there's something to be learned from good stories and something to be learned from bad stories. I mean, sometimes something is so terrible that maybe you can't learn anything from it. But rarely with the stories that are sent to us, are they that bad? Right. I think you have to have a little bit of talent or a little bit of tradesmanship or or whatever the word is used where experience has gotten you to a point to start submitting your work around. As far as I know, we don't get a lot of like junior high kids sending us their work. I don't know. Life is 
A journey, not a destination. Don't say goodbye. Say good journey. There you go. <laughs> not all tears are in evil. Okay, so I, I, I don't think that this was a, a lambasting negative episode. But now that it's done, tell me what you think. I think it was fairly, what's the word? C -c Fun, when's it my turn? Oh, <laughs> Sorry, it took me a second to figure out what you were doing there. I think we were uh, constructive enough that it's, uh, it wasn't a lambasting. I think we, we should be all right. You know, we meant no offense and uh, hopefully no offense is taken. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license.